The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to discuss fall garden preparation as well as what is eating my plants as well. And our guest is internet garden expert Greg Peterson, and we'll tackle your garden questions. The hour is full, so join us. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Happy you've taken time out of your day to allow us to be part of it. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. If you want to partake in the program, in addition to consuming it with your ears, you can do that by sending us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com or you can give us a call toll free coast to coast at 1-800-927-SHOW that's 1-800-927-7469 if we can't get to you leave a message we will answer you we'll give you a call back with the answer to your question so uh big show today we're going to discuss fall planting preparations again we appreciate you tuning in whether you're listening to us on one of the 20 am and fm frequencies broadcasting our program here in 2023 through our parent website which is the wisconsin vegetable gardener.com underneath the radio season seven tab podcast replay or in studio video replay thank you very much and thank you for telling your friends about the program fall garden preparation is something that we have to uh it now's the time holly to start thinking about it some people often think that gardening is in most portions of the country from memorial day to labor day and that's it but there's so much more yeah a lot of people do think that and that's how they garden and that's okay but you can start earlier and you can you can grow grow uh further into past labor day so what you want to do is you want to determine your first average frost date and all you have to do is just go to um, your favorite search engine and type in frost first frost date and your zip code and it will tell you ours is i think october 15th somewhere in that range it's a average of the last 10 years so this the plants in which you're going to put in the ground for your fall garden these are not do or die plants if the frost hits the frost date is a guideline to know when to plant all of these plants you can also plant in the spring and you plant them well before your first average or your last average frost date in the spring. You got your radishes, your turnips, your rutabagas, your uh, brassicas, those type of plants, your lettuces, your greens, those you plant in the spring and you can also plant in the fall. But that average frost date for la- first average frost date is kind of the guideline to go okay, now I'm going to go or, or let's just October 15th, let's pick that number. Now we're going to back up X amount of weeks to get to the point of, okay, I need to put this in the ground. Now I can wait on that for another couple of weeks. So they will tolerate frost. And most of these vegetables, when frost occurs on them, it actually helps them. They like the cooler night temperatures. They like that chill in the air. It helps them release some of the sugars to make the the crop uh, sweeter right and some of these you can even plant alongside um, or you can plant them alongside what you have now but just things like kale which you are going to start a little bit earlier but then it's going to live out through um, even a frost you can kind of have you know if you're like I don't know where to put some of these plants you could have an area reserved in your garden or if you have an area where you have maybe cucumbers, cucumbers are not a long living garden plant. 60 days yeah, to 60 70 days. days is when they start maturing and uh, about 80 to 90. I mean, they've got about a three to four week shelf life there uh, yeah. on the plant. Uh, so you can definitely keep that in mind um, for the cucumbers. So maybe you want to put something else where those cucumbers are or perhaps like we're going to harvest our garlic uh, very soon and some people will backfill with a summer crop or you can just save that space 
for a fall crop. Now, yeah, when we've harvested our garlic, we have put potatoes in behind it for a fall potato harvest. Now, potatoes are a, a uh, they don't like frost, so they will die at the frost when frost hits. But with that time frame, the 70, 80, 90 day potatoes, we could get a crop in there. I've also planted potatoes or uh, tomatoes in behind the garlic. But now let's talk about the fall crops here. There's what you plant in the spring, you can plant in the fall with some variations here. Like, for example, 10 to 12 weeks before your first frost date in the fall, you can plant broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, celery carrots. You may not get the same type of end harvest, meaning the luscious big plant that you would if you planted in the spring. Uh, it varies. Your mileage varies based on your geographical area. And you don't have to start these indoors like some people choose to do in the spring. You can direct sow the seed right in the ground, keep the soil moist, and then the plant will begin to grow. And I'm guessing, again, Holly, whenever you planted any of these in your backyard garden growing up, there was no plant starts. You just put these in the ground and they grew in the spring and, and the way it went. Listen. Yes. Don't mock. Don't mock. Not the mocking. I'm just verifying for all of us whom have never heard of and such a um, gardening technique of direct sowing everything at the at Memorial Day weekend and then and no plant starts. You know, our ancestors probably just sow directly. Possibly, you know, yes. In the in the ground. I mean they probably lived till they were like thirty years old too. Well you look at a but, lot a lot of these things in which you, the tomato falls from the ground because you didn't or to the ground because you didn't pick it this year and you've got seventeen little tomato plants coming up next spring when the soil conditions are favorable for them. Right. So anyway, we didn't grow much of a fall garden. Okay. But um, you could you could put these things into the ground, especially any sort of root crop. You just want to you just want to put that seed directly into the right. ground. Right, carrots. Whenever you plant your carrots, plant carrots are very small and just uh, eighth of an inch of soil on top of them. Hydrate the soil first, then plant your carrots. Drizzle a little potting soil over top of them or fine compost. Cover them with a cardboard or a sheet of plywood. Uh, small piece or two by eight, some kind of board. What you're doing is you're per, you're preventing the moisture from evaporating out of the soil and away from the seed. By holding that moisture into the next to the seed and into the soil, it's going to germinate about eighty percent better rate than if you just left it bare and watered it whenever you remember it. Once the seeds have germinated, well, you're going to do this. You're going to leave it covered for about three weeks, four, fourteen to twenty one days. You'll remove the covering, whether it's cardboard plywood, two by eight, whatever the case is, you'll start seeing white, long, stringy things. Those are the carrots. Remove them, uh, the board, the covering, and then allow them to be, they're going to they're gonna green up and they're going to start growing vertically. You're going to have a phenomenal carrot crop by doing that. Carrots take 60 to 70 days to grow. Uh, beets, you want to start those about six to eight weeks before your last, before your first average frost date. Radishes, you can Back that, you know, you don't have to go that far. Radishes take 30 days. So if your first average frost date is October 15th, you could start planting them middle of September, early September. 30 days radishes, really easy. Um, and then if you want to, and, and turnips and rutabagas, we start in zone 5A. We plant those first of August. Rutabagas take 90 days. Turnips take 60 days. We have only found success with them as a fall crop. For whatever reason, we're not able to grow them in the spring. They go to bolt. They don't like it. But we are able to have a harvest of both of those in the fall. And late October, middle of November, we harvest them. And there's a lot of great recipes in which you can uh, bake them with seasoning in the oven. Now, if you're wanting to protect your plants such as for a cold frame holly or a road cover, you can do that as well. Yeah, you can do that, and that will actually extend your – you can start a, a couple weeks later. Season with, extender. Yeah, it's a season extender. So if your – whatever you're planting in is six to eight weeks before your frost date, like beets or radishes, even carrots, you can – you could then move that to um, – Late, later, three, yeah, yeah, three to four weeks before right. your last average frost day. I had to do the the math in my head there, so that gives you an option. And a lot of people will then even once these are established, will move them into winter and do like a year round cold frame gardening. 
And that is an option as well. Now, with the cold frame, that doesn't mean it's a greenhouse. It's a protection of the plants. The plants are not going to show magna- magnific- magnificent growth. It's going to sustain growth. So you want to get your plant established to a larger state, and then it's going to sustain. Like if you're going to have um, greens, uh, lettuces or spinach or um, – I'm thinking, what, what do we got? Swiss chard, those type of things, kale. It's, it's going to sustain it. It's going to keep it alive. It's not going to you know, have bountiful expansion of growth because it's 12 degrees outside and 28 to 35 degrees in this cold frame. So keep that in mind. However, it can extend your harvest so you're not having to harvesting everything. Yeah, you want to make sure that you don't have to use a cold frame or anything like right. that. I just We're just saying that's an option. So just keep that in mind. You don't have to use a cold frame. You can still do fall planting. It's not a requirement. Don't think you have to invest or create a cold frame situation. You absolutely do not. Well, it's, a, it's a fun little project on a, on a, sun, a Saturday afternoon. Now, with all of these crops, with pretty much any of these crops, if they are exposed to the environment, at, you know, when it gets down to 10, 5, negative 3, they're going to die and they're going to show – you're not going to be able to do much with them. They're, they're dead. So you want to be harvesting them if they are unprotected before those very harsh temp- temp- temperatures occur. Frost, light frost, heavy frost, all these are going to be fine. It's when you get to that frigid teens – low 20s, single digits, that's whenever you're not going to have anything left here. So if you have never planted a fall garden, this might be the opportunity to dabble in a few plants of of ease, uh, greens, some uh, lettuces, radishes, something small so you can continue to get something out of the garden. And if you have still the extended period of time prior to your first average frost date, you can certainly get some of those second summer crops in, cucumbers, maybe a few short growing season tomatoes, or a few uh, short growing season early potatoes in for your fall harvest, and a variety of other things that you can put in the ground. Well, Holly, Walton's Incorporated has the seasonings and the spices that you need in order to season your vegetables, your root crops that you put in the oven, or your meats, or uh, your barbecue or kitchen needs. Yeah, absolutely. Walton's has everything you can get for equipment, seasoning, supplies to make sausage, jerky, and any other meat products your way to your high standards. But no meat. Yeah, but no meat, so they have everything but the meat. You can make snack sticks that you'll probably hopefully like um, versus maybe some rough ones you've had. Walton's created MeatJustSticks.com. It's an informational site to help educate the hows and whys of meat processing as well as a community of over 15,000 users who will help give their opinion and guidance on meat processing issues. When you go to waltonsinc.com, they have everything you need to make these meat products. Again, the spices just for any sort of cooking, etc. And then they have meat grinders, mixers, sausage stuffers to help you go from animal to edible. Walton's everything but the meat. You can use code GROW50 to save 10% off your orders of $50 or more. That's GROW50 at checkout. Save 10% on your orders of $50 or more. When we come back, hang out with us just moments away. We're going to discuss what's eating my plants. A topic that we are probably all dealing with in our garden gardens. You're tuned in to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now 1-800-927-SHOW. Group 6 produces American-made products with sleek designs and quality materials. Based and manufactured in Utah, they have high-quality and durable products to last a lifetime. They are built beyond tough. Their belts are minimalist and one-of-a-kind with no holes or flap hanging over. Designs and styles for men and women. Something for everyone. Versatile to mix and match fashionable buckles and belt webbing. Colorful or timeless designs to match your style. You know how bulky and uncomfortable a belt can be, but not a problem with the Grip 6 belt. Comfortable but durable, a belt that moves and works with you and your lifestyle. Perfect for all the bending, twisting, shifting, and moving during gardening, yard work, and all of your everyday life. It's almost like you're not wearing a belt at all. Design and manufacture in and house for the best results and quality every time. When you purchase from Grip 6, you're supporting long life cycle products and American made manufacturing. Check out their belts, walls, and socks at grip6.com. Use code RADIO15 to save 15% off at grip6.com. 
Tree hugger sprinklers are the ultimate watering device for either your newly planted or established trees and shrubs. Our sprinklers open and close around the trunk of your tree and provide 360 degrees of watering. With our adjustable valve, you can direct the water to your tree's targeted saturation zone. They come in three sizes, 7, 11, and 15 inches. You can purchase a tree hugger sprinkler at your local garden center, feed store, or hardware store. Go to treehuggersprinklers.com to find a retailer close to you. Or you can buy it directly from Amazon or treehuggersprinklers.com. If you're an independent nursery, garden center, hardware store, or feed store, you will want to stock this product. Contact the good people at Tree Hugger Sprinklers, and they will get you set up. Your tree's best friend. TreeHuggerSprinklers.com. Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardeners, farms, landscaping, and more. To find our products nearest you, visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com. Fleet Farms Garden Center is now open. Stop in to check out their selection of nursery quality plants available at low prices. All of their plants are grown in the Midwest and their vegetables are incesticide free. Choose from annuals, perennials, shrubs, trees, and more. Plus take care of your lawn with grass seed fertilizers, lawnmowers, and string trimmers. Get everything you need to keep your yard looking great at Fleet Farm, your lawn and garden headquarters. Chapin has the tools for planting your garden and keeping it growing all season long. Whether your garden is big or small, Chapin has sprayers and spreaders for fertilizing, weed, and pest control, watering, and seeding. You can find Chapin products at your local hardware store, big box retailer. You may visit them also online at ChapinMFG.com to learn more and buy online. We know that you appreciate the value of a beautifully landscaped yard, but tackling such a project yourself can seem way too complicated, right? Bloomin' Easy Plants are the answer. Their plants are low maintenance and offer exceptional beauty and color for your yard. Plus, they offer free seasonal care reminders with simple how-to videos tailored to the plants that you choose. With Bloomin' Easy on your side, creating the yard that you've always wanted becomes as easy as plant, water, and relax. Check them out at your local garden center or by visiting bloomingeasyplants.com. Mantis Tillers, the premium long-lasting gas-powered tillers, are the perfect solution for any garden. This Mantis machine is available with two or four cycle engines with a 19-inch or 16-inch tilling width. Your DIY companion in your garden and your lawn converts easily for edging, aerating, and more with optional attachments. Find details at mantis.com. Goodbye, biting bugs and plant invaders. No More Bugs by Naturally Green Products is your answer. A product pioneered by the USDA in 14 years in business, No More Bugs has been a favorite by consumers across the country. More than a repellent, it is safe for you, your plants, pets, and home. Visit nomorebugs.net. Free shipping on orders over $50. Use code FREESHIP for me. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Dripworks, Rise Gardens, Grip6, Bloomin' Easy, Fleet Farm, Waltons Incorporated, Blue Ribbon Organics, Tree Diaper. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for allowing us to be with you. Moments away, we're going to discuss what's eating my plants or what's eating your plants. But first, a word from our good friends from Farm Defense. Farm and garden in ultimate comfort. Farmer's Defense has lightweight and durable sleeves made to protect you against the elements while farming. Farmer sleeves offer unparalleled protection of arms and skin for any farmer, gardener, or outdoor worker. Say goodbye to irritated skin and sunburns in the garden. Their sleeves offer cooling comfort and protection against elements. Outdoors and alternative with thick clothing. Farmer's Defense is made of wicking material with UBF protection. Factor 50 plus to protect you from allergies and scratches. To find out their great products and more, visit FarmersDefense.com. So one of the things that many people are dealing with right now in, in your probably in that category is something's eating my plants or something looks to be eating my plants. What could it be? Well, we've got a number of things that could be eating your plants. We're going to try to uh, verbally describe what these conditions appear to be on a plant, and then you can do some internet wandering and look for some images to see if that matches up to your um, problem. 
if things are being eaten off the top and nibbled off the top, it could be deer or rabbit. Uh, deer defense, uh, deer defeat is a great product. Use radio at checkout, save 10% on your order. It is a organic safe uh, application in which you does not wash off with rain, sleet, snow, freeze, uh, applies every 30 days, and it keeps the animals from eating the plants. You can either spray it directly on the plants based on the conditions or around the perimeter, and it will help repel the plants. So DeerDefeat.com, radio at checkout, and save 10% uh, on your order. So that's things, if, if, you're, if you're seeing things being eaten off the top or uh, potentially nibbled on. And you might see the animal anyway. Yeah, yeah, you might you might see the animal as well. Uh, so leaf miners, Holly. Yeah, so leaf miners are basically just little, um, they're little insects that literally like mine the leaves of your plants. They get between the the top and the bottom, of the, in the center, yeah. and, and they just chew away and make little tunnels. Yep. So it'll almost look like you'll see sometimes holes, but you'll also see these little tunnels. Um, it'll look kind of blistery, blotchy, almost like bleach spots or right. bleach. Um, dead areas. Like dead areas, yeah. And they're called serpentine tum- tunnels. Sometimes you'll see like leafy uh, feces. So it'll be like little leafy looking um, drops, not drops. I can't think of the word. But yeah, so that's because of these leaf miners. So what you can do is you can crush the larvae. Um, so what would you, you would find them in your leaves and then you would crush them. And that's one great way. Otherwise you can use things like neem oil, BT spray, and then, um, otherwise some people will add beneficial nematodes to their soil to help prevent that problem. If you, I would not advise eating the leaf that is damaged because there's probably something in that leaf. If you're, you know, that insect, so dispose of it in a, um, way that you feel it's going to destroy that insect inside that leaf, whether it's compost or burn or run it down the street and throw it in your neighbor's backyard, whatever it is, you, you want to, you don't want to consume that. Tomato hornworm is another uh, insect that is destroying your tomato plants. And you will see the leaves being, you're going to have a bare plant or areas of a bare plant if no fruit is on Tomatoes. it. Tomatoes, yeah. right. Uh, or if you have green tomatoes or just I'm going to harvest it tomorrow tomatoes, you're going to see a big chunks eaten out of it with droplets or black tiny particles left as a remains, which is the feces of the hornworm. Hornworms are active mostly during dawn and dusk and will nest up underneath the leaves and limbs of a tomato plant And if you do not know what you're looking for, you're going to look right at them and not notice them. So there's a couple of ways in which you can combat the damage of which these tomato hornworms are doing to your garden. One is if you see the damage, there's probably more than one of these on plants or on one plant or multiple plants. They will, if you have plants that are very close to one another, they're going to find all the plants in your area. You can hit them with a hose, hit the plant with a hose that will typically dislodge them. You can also uh, bring in or encourage birds to come into your garden by incorporating either a bird bath or bird feeders or uh, feeding areas in which they can eat. And it's as simply as simple as a tuna can on a wooden stick filled with bird seed or peanuts or old garden seeds that are not viable anymore. They will come in, feed on that, see the hornworms, and consume them. Also, it cannot be done at this particular time, but during the fall months or early spring, where you've had the tomatoes prior or uh, at the previous year, disturb that soil, whether by fork or by tiller, and that will disrupt the larvae, which is buried in the soil, to the point where 90% of the larvae is not going to survive. So those are some ways in which you can do that. Other people have found taking a UV or a black light out at nighttime, they will see and can illuminate the hornworm that way as well, and then you can pick them off and get rid of them. So hornworms have 
uh, devastated our crops many years, but implementing the tillage of the area, bringing in birds by bird feeders or places for feeding them, that has eliminated almost every hornworm that we could have potentially had in the last seven years. I don't think we've had one in the last seven years since we've been implementing those two uh, techniques in our garden. Right. So, yep, that's what you can do with the hornworm. So then we have the potato bug or the potato beetle or the Colorado potato beetle. And you know that it exists because you'll have these little bites out of the leaves of the um, potato plant. And what you can do is typically most people find it most effective to find the potato beetles and smash them. And yeah. that's, that's usually how you get rid of them. It's, and it's typically, it will be like on one plant, not not all the plants. Uh, others will take a, a portable vacuum or extension cord and vacuum up the beetles in a shot vac. Um, there is not a true and fast method that, okay, I can spray on the potatoes and the potato horn or the potato, Colorado potato beetle will go away and it'll die. Some applications are more effective on the larvae which is underneath the leaves and not so much on the parent or the adult plant uh, insects so controlling the larvae is one way in which to eliminate and then doing the vacuum or uh, squeezing them or putting them in a bucket of soapy water it's a time consumption method however it can save your potato crop Another one is Japanese beetles. Yeah, so Japanese beetles are actually an invasive species that came up from Asia, and they look like these little emerald-backed beetles. They're very pretty. Um, when they're not eating your plants. Yeah, when they're not eating your plants. And it's another thing where you'll find these little chewed holes. Sometimes they'll just eat kind of down to the skeleton of a leaf of the plant. It's uh, it's very unfortunate. And so most people, what they'll do is they'll get the Japanese beetle traps, which is smart, but then they'll put them right next to the plants. and From rescue.com. From, yeah, from rescue.com. And that's not what you want to do. You want to put them in the opposite corner of your yard so that because these traps do attract the beetles and they trap them very successfully, but then it seems like you're luring them into your yard. So if you put it in the opposite corner, then you'll lure them away from your garden yeah many people oh the, my cherry tree is getting attacked okay let me hang it right underneath the cherry tree and now it's a party in your backyard uh with all the beetles in the area predominantly growing up this was a, a big problem with pole beans and bush beans that these beetles would attack uh we never noticed it and we don't notice it on tomato plants but it's the 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 green beans is what they they really seem to and um sunflowers are another one and then they can eradicate rose plants uh just very quickly other people may choose to vacuum them up or put them in soapy water, a bucket of soapy water, but the rescue trap works the most effectively. You can also use milky spore and in, ingest that, uh, inject that into the soil. You can also use Grub Gone from, Grub Gone, uh, from Phylum Bioproducts and spray directly on your plants, edible or ornamental, and that will kill the 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 uh, beetle as well and it's very effective so there's uh, several great commercially available methods in which to either prevent pre pre uh, prevent them from damaging your plants or trying to salvage the plants in which they're damaging so if you don't have any japanese beetles now or you have very few of them you may want to go ahead and get a trap or get the uh beetle gone from phylum in order to be proactive instead of reactive to them. And this is just some of the many different plants that could, or bugs that could be eating your plants. We can touch on uh, squash vine borer real quickly. Yeah, so the squash vine borer typically eats um, a lot of squash plants, but it's a lot of times it's zucchini. And then is it the butter? pumpkin? Pumpkin, oh yeah, pumpkin. Butternut, it won't. Yeah, butternut is the one that it won't. So any other squash plant, but the butternut squash plant. And what they do is they they lay their larvae into the base of the stem of your squash plants, and then when that larvae 
starts to develop and eats, it eats up through the stem of your plants. And that's when your plant starts to die. It severs the nutrients from the roots up to the plant, and it looks like the plant needs water. You water it, and it just gets droopier and droopier. And at that point, the su survival rate is almost zero for your zucchini plant. As your plants begin to grow, your pumpkins, your squash plants, your viney acorn cramp, cr uh, plants, all those, you want to look at the base, and you want to see if there has been an injection of larvae in the base. You can tell this by the sap being dribbled out of a particular hole, uh, the honeydew of it, and then you can cut into it gently by not severing the stem, but opening a cavity up. And at that point, you will see the larva and you can extract it that way. If you go to our parent website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com and in the upper right corner search bar, type in squash vine borer. We have a number of demonstrational videos explaining how to do this in order to get zucchini and pumpkins and squash. And this has been the go-to method for us for many years in order to get those harvesting uh, vegetables. Otherwise, we would not be able to. That has been the only true method that we have found, Holly, that everybody says, you know, there's many methods. Put aluminum foil around the base. Do this. Yeah, do that. Put like, uh, a lot of these, you can put those floating row covers, um, especially we didn't talk about cabbage moss, but right. that's a, a common one as well. However, we did learn that um, sometimes they're not as effective as as you think, or by the time you get them out, your plants might already be... And you got to take them off to get them pollinated anyway. Right. So th there's some issues there. Well, we talked about phylum bioproducts with the beetle gone, and uh, you certainly can get that from phylum bioproducts. They also have a number of other products. They have another product that which you can do that. So if you uh, have already got Japanese beetles, weevils, boars in your garden, phylum bioproducts is the go-to place for your resolution to your problem. And what better way to prevent those pests from destroying your garden than by controlling them while they are larva? Grub Gone is an easy, a easy to apply granular product that can spread on your turf successfully to control grub invaders. Developed by phylum bioproducts from a naturally occurring bacteria, Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT product that specifically targets only certain scare pests. And it's safe to use around bees and other beneficial insects. Yes, if you already have those beetles flying around your yard, Beetle Gone is the is an organic water dispersible powder that you can spray directly on your edible plants. Find out more at phylumbioproducts.com. That's P H Y L L O M Bioproducts.com. Hang out with us when we come back. Greg Peterson will be with us. Internet garden expert. You're tuned in to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at dripworks.com. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit proplugger.com. Jung Seed Company is a family-owned and operated gardening company since 1907 with the largest selection of seeds and plants online. Use coupon code 10TG23 to receive 10% off your order at jungseeds.com. Again, that coupon code is 10TG23. Going on vacation and can't find a plant sitter? Check out Tree Diaper. It can provide perfect soil moisture for plants for weeks, even months. Use coupon code GARDEN15 to save 15% off at TreeDiaper.com. Aqua-Mart.com has everything you need for eye-pleasing outdoor water features on your property. For over 25 years, we've been creating and field testing beautiful water features in order to provide you with the most reliable products and best value in the industry. From easy-to-install pond and water filled kits to pumps, fish food, and more, you'll find everything you need to install and maintain a naturally balanced water feature in your yard. Make your backyard a true oasis and maintain it well. Visit Aqua-Mart.com to shop for all your needs. Deer Defeat is an all-natural based animal repellent to keep deer and rabbits away from your valuable plants that is odorless after 30 minutes and dries clear. It creates a continuous, invisible shield to protect your plants. 
Works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Will not clog your sprayer. Apply to your property without environmental damage. You can spray directly onto your plants up to flowering, then apply around your plants to continue protection. No need to reapply. Money back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use coupon code RADIO to save 10% off your order. You put a lot of time and energy in your garden, but without a rescue Japanese beetle trap, you can kiss that hard work goodbye. Asparagus annihilated. Raspberries ravished. Green beans, forget about it. Get those little invasive pests out of your garden and send them where they belong inside a rescue Japanese beetle trap. Now with available refill lures, rescue Japanese beetle traps can be used for multiple seasons. They're made in the USA by the makers of the popular rescue fly and yellow jacket traps. Learn more at rescue.com. That's R-E-S-C-U-E dot com. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Happy Leaf LED, Root Maker, Jung Seeds, Tree Hugger Sprinklers, Verlo Mattresses, Farmer's Defense, Pomona Universal Pectin, Natural Green Products, Mantis Tillers. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Moments away, Greg Peterson. But first, Rise Gardens. Rise Gardens is a revolutionary hydroponic gardening system for your home. Instead of food traveling hundreds or even over a thousand miles before it hits your plate, harvest the veggies and herbs and greens you need for dinner tonight in the comfort of your home. No green thumb required knowledge. Gardening makes easy with Rise Gardens app. Step-by-step guidance from seed to harvest. A complete garden on a shelf and comes with everything you need to grow healthy and the freshest food for you and your loved ones. Fully customize your garden to your needs and preferences. For more information, go to risegardens.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guests for this week. Greg Peterson created urbanfarm.org from a passion for urban farming. The passion grew as he created the urban farm in Phoenix, Arizona, on one third acre where he planted 70 plus fruit trees there and online. He educates and empowers people to plant their own. Through this entity, he offers fruit, food growing related classes, both online and in person, as well as events to promote fruit and vegetable seeds combined with topic related education. Welcome to the program. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, we thank you for taking time out of your day and your, to not only educate Holly and myself, but all of our listeners. And, and I'll, I'll start with this, Greg. Uh, it's a three-part question, so we'll, we'll work through it here. What is urban farming? Pa- why are you so passionate about urban farming? Okay. What is an urban farmer? So I have said for years that the, with a capital T, solution to, all, to our global food challenges is growing food in the city. So urban farming and being an urban farmer is all about figuring out how to grow food where it's needed, which is in cities. And it can be container farms. It can be, you know, traditional two, three, four acre farms. It can be in warehouses and backyards. In fact, when I was in college, I went back to college at the age of 40. And when I was in college, I used to farm my front and backyard and I'd on Wednesday mornings, I'd get up early and harvest what I could and take it to the market. I would uh, walk away with two or $300 cash, and anything I had left over, I took to my friend Susan at the Calico Cow, and she fed me lunch. <laughs> so that's that's what urban farming is. So, you, and, so one has to have, have to want to do this. Oh, yeah, and it's a passion. It's absolutely a passion. And I think the question is, the next question was where the passion come from for me. Yes. I honestly have to say I was born with it. In 1974, in the eighth grade, I wrote a paper on how we were overfishing the oceans. I knew back then that there was something inherently wrong with the way we were eating and living on the planet. And it just developed from there. I learned about permaculture in 1991 and read a book called Ishmael by Daniel Quinn, who talks all about how our food system came to be a consumptive food system rather than a, a con- contributory food system, one that contributes to us. And um, my next, I think the next question is what, 
Uh, tell me what the next question is. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so speaking about, you said you have to, you know, obviously want to urban farm and have the desire. What is, would you say, the biggest hurdle people face when starting their own urban farm? Their head. Okay. Their head gets in the way. I, I have said for a long time that being an urban farmer is simply growing food and sharing it, whether you're sharing it with your friends, your family, the local farmer's market, grow food. And farming is a profession. Gardening is a hobby. So I encourage people to grow food and share it. Call yourself a farmer. It's a different way of interacting with it. And then name your farm. When you name your farm, it creates a conversation in the world about food and about what you're doing. You know, you walk up to somebody, what do you do? Oh, I run um, Two Fat Cats Apartment Garden. She named it. Right. And that gets the conversation going. The urban farm in Phoenix was called the urban farm for over 25 years when I lived there. And it was a space to have a conversation around local food. Now, does one have to have experience in gardening before or growing in order to have an urban farm? Or is that what you're talking about? Their head gets in the way. Well, I've never done that's, it before, so I can't do it. Yeah, that's your head getting in the okay. way. Plant something, grow something. Uh, one of the easiest ways to get into it as a profession is make friends with a chef or two near your house and find out what they want you to grow and then just start growing for them. And basil is super easy to grow and most chefs want basil. Mm. And, and you know, you, you get, if you're already friends with a chef, typically it's a higher end restaurant. So they're going to pay you good quality return for good quality product. Yep. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, there's nothing better than growing basil or peaches or squash or anything like that. And then going to the restaurant the day that you delivered early, going to the restaurant for dinner, you're a hero there. Hmm. I had that happen so many times in Phoenix where I'd, I'd take baskets of food to the chefs and then you go there for dinner and it's like, you know, you're, you're a hero there. It's like, they introduce you to everybody in the restaurant. This guy grew our peaches. Well, tell us about what you provide on your website and what you do from what what you do from there. What you do there. So, urbanfarm.org is my website, and it's a, a informational source on how to grow food. Really, anywhere, but urban areas for sure. Uh, we offer a series. We have seven different courses that people can take. We always have free monthly classes. Uh, gardenchat.org and seedchat.org are our two free monthly classes that we give. People just, you know, you just sign up for them and you get a notice. And each month we talk about seed saving and seeds or gardening and with a special guest. And then I have my Urban Farm podcast, which is seven and a half years old and over 750 episodes at this point uh, with a lot of content on how to grow food. And the podcast is mostly an interview podcast. So I find people that are doing cool things and it can be all the way from rock stars. I've had rock stars on my podcast, uh, rock star farmers to, you know, backyard gardeners. And they're just telling their success stories and it, it's very motivational. Well, I like websites like yours, urbanfarm.org, for one main reason. You tell the truth and you tell it how it's supposed to be done in order to be successful, not because here's what I'm going to say because I'll get clicks and I'll get revenue because of those clicks. Right. Because there's a yeah. there's plenty of those people out there. They will tell you whatever you want to hear so you keep coming back, even if you're a failure at what you're being told that is a success. Exactly. And I'm just in it because I've been doing it for 40 years, and it's what I'm supposed to be doing on the planet. We have a very, very broken food system on this planet. It delivers unhealthy food, and my goal is to transform our global food system to a local food system. Which was what the 
intentions of Native Americans. That's what they did. They ate what was there, and then when they right, and then they moved. If they didn't have what was left, I mean, we've lost all of that knowledge. They knew that tree did this, and that plant did that, and if you touched that, you died. And we don't know any of that now. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So speaking of this, it seems that gardening homesteading is becoming a lost skill or not as much interest from younger people. Do you agree? And how would you say you could get younger people to engage more? Actually, I'm seeing a lot of younger people, millennials jumping in. Uh, I have this theory and the theory goes like this. People change for two reasons. 99% of the time people change because they get hit by a Mack truck. You know, and you can call that Mack truck a storm in Texas or uh, COVID uh, or the economic downturn in 2009 that we had, uh, all of which times my listenership and interest exploded. One percent of the time people change because they choose to change. And that's really what I'm sharing is really great information to hopefully inspire people to choose to change and get systems in place before before the food system breaks down any further. Right. Make the be proactive instead of having to figure out what to do right when the mess is on the floor. Exactly. Um, yeah, we we've seen during those. Well, we've been around for seven years, but we've seen when. COVID hit the numbers went oh, yeah. sky high, and we yeah. and then when COVID went away, however you want to describe or believe in that, people went back to normal life and things went back to normal, quote unquote. <laughs> right? Yeah, and my goal is to figure out how to get people inspired to not go back to normal. Yeah. So you recently moved from North Carolina to or from to North Carolina from Phoenix. What are some gardening challenges that you will now face and how will you overcome them? Oh, my gosh. So I actually gardened for 45 years in Phoenix. I started when I was mid-teens and I gardened until I left a year and a half ago. And the challenge we have in Arizona is making sure that things get watered. And that's pretty straightforward, especially with drip tape. That helps a lot. And there wasn't a lot of pest pressure in Arizona. I didn't have a whole lot of pests to deal with. And what I've what I've learned since I got here is the pest pressure is exponentially greater here because it's so green. We get on average of four inches of rain a month here. In Arizona, we got on average of about a half an inch of rain a month. So there's uh, molds and funguses and things like that that, you know, if you're overwater your potatoes, I did that this week. My potatoes were overwatered and they died. Mm. So I'm really having to pay attention more to disease pressure and pest pressure that's here that I didn't really have to deal with in Phoenix. One of the things that I discovered since I got here, and this is available in Phoenix as well, is the Cooperative Extension and the farm rep at the Cooperative Extension. So I've actually been working with our local farm rep here in North Carolina, and she's helped a lot. That's what they're there for, to help you so you don't make the mistakes so you can be successful. Um, And that's, you know, your big, big change going from across the country. Uh, Right. But uh, if it was easy, everybody would do it. Yeah. So, well, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to, to educate us here, Greg. How can people find out more about you? You spoke of your website. Uh, mention that again and what we can find on that. Urbanfarm.org is our website. And there's lots of information. The blog's 15 years old. There's lots of information on fruit trees, gardening. Uh, and uh, we've got two monthly things that we do. I mentioned them earlier, seedchat.org and gardenchat.org. And you just go there and sign up to sign up page. You give me your email address. And once a month, I'll send you an email that says, hey, 
our seed chat this week, this month is about such and such. And uh, we're all about educating people and making sure that they know how to most successfully grow food. Well, Greg, thank you so much for the time you've given us and, and the education uh, for Holly and myself and all of our listeners. Thank you. I, uh, I've actually been listening to your show, and I love it. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate the, the voice of uh, excitement there. Absolutely. Thank you. And when we come back, it's your garden questions, our garden answers. You're tuned in to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now 1-800-927-SHOW. Hi, I'm Russell Taylor with Live Earth Products. I'm a soil health expert here to help you. Live Earth Products specializes in soil conditioners and fertilizers that will help you build healthy and vibrant flower and vegetable gardens. As our name describes, Live Earth means healthy soils. Live Earth products are humic and fulvic soil amendments and are all natural, organic, and directly from our family mine in Utah. Live Earth products are easy to apply and the results will blossom right before your eyes. Live Earth products can be applied throughout the growing season. So pick up Live Earth Humate Soil Conditioner and Liquid 6 Humic Acid at your local garden center or on Amazon. Also available through our website, liveearth.com. That's L-I-V-E-A-R-T-H. Dot com. Live Earth, here to bring vitality to life in your garden. You know what's different about Verlo Mattress? Everything. Like no price gouging, no shenanigans, none of the shady dealings of other mattress chains and furniture stores that overcharge for virtually the same mattress. The ripoff stops here. Verlo makes every mattress they sell, so you get better quality, lower prices, and a lifetime comfort guarantee. Because at the end of the day, you don't deserve shenanigans. You deserve a good night's sleep. Wake up. Sleep better. Verlo. Dripping Springs Oyas. Clay pot irrigation solves the watering needs for gardens, bushes, new trees, and more. An ancient irrigation system we brought to America. Dripping Springs Oyas. O-L-L-A-S. On YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Check us out. Garden like a pro in three easy steps and receive customized fertilizer recommendations for your garden or lawn. Soil Savvy helps you determine what nutrients your plants need to thrive. Never again overapply nutrients they don't need. A patented process that makes you a smart gardener. To get your soil test kit, go to MySoilSavvy.com. Wind River Chimes creates a symphony in any space. Chimes that are inspired by nature and designed to make the natural world even more inspiring. Music speaks to everyone. Individually handcrafted in Virginia for over 35 years and hand-tuned for an exceptional precision and lasting beauty. Because in life, the winds of change are always moving. But no matter where they carry you, Wind River Chimes will always be the inspiring harmony. With a large selection and customization options, you will find the sound that soothes you. Visit windriverchimes.com to shop and find out more. Rootmaker starts your plants off right and keeps them going through harvest. From their seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots to their large variety of grow bags, 1 to 60 gallons. Their products will provide you the harvest you've never seen before. Visit rootmaker.com and use coupon code RADIO23 to save 15% off your order at rootmaker.com. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Aqua-Mart, Soil Savvy, Wind River Chimes, Wisconsin Greenhouse Company, Pro Plugger, Deer Defeat, Dripping Springs Oyas, Phylum Bioproducts. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for being with us. Time for your questions, our answers. If you've got a question, send it on over to GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. That's GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. Toll free, coast to coast. If you want to give us a call, 1-800-927-SHOW. 1-800-927-7469. Oh. This question is sponsored by Fleet Farm and FleetFarm.com. Can you feed most plants with tomato feed or is there anything better? Thank you. So tomato fertilizer, tomato feed, it has a formulation for tomatoes. However, even though tomato feed is labeled for tomatoes, it works well 
for all types of fruiting plants to encourage fruit growth. Make sure that you mix in the fertilizer at the, in, at the time of planting or apply it according to the manufacturer's instructions. If you apply too much, the fertilizer can burn the plants and too little won't hurt the plants, but you won't have or see any effects that you're wanting to have happen by using that fertilizer. All right, my cucumbers taste sour. Why is this? So basically, a lot of it comes from high heat and in, 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 in inconsistent temperature swings. The watering process has a major impact, so too little water followed by dry spells will often cause higher levels of the bitterness and sour taste. So the biggest thing is to to irrigate, yes. to uh, wa- make sure you are watering consistently. And harvesting and, at the right time yes. helps too. Absolutely. When they get too, too big, they're going to naturally just taste bitter or sour as opposed to harvesting them more a little bit, when they're a little bit smaller, they'll have a better taste. Yeah, they're, they get to a point where they switch and they go to seed reproduction uh, manufacturing inside of the fruit and uh, it doesn't care about uh, what it tastes like and it's not growing it for you either. All right, uh, what is the Let's see here. Let me see. What is the best thickness for mulch on a walk path between raised beds? Um, So two to four inches. Yeah, two to four inches. It will help. And then and then you it will um, if you do more than that, you won't allow drainage. So you want some drainage. Too much melt mulch is bad, and obviously too little mulch yeah, is not good. Yeah, either. if you're not going to put enough down, there's no point of putting anything down. And, you know, you can get mulch either delivered from your local municipality. Um, in this instance, you don't have to really worry about what, you know, like in, in with the soil, you need to kind of know the source. Is it good, you know, what what is, ha, how's it been made? What potential uh chemicals could be in it is it organic or is it not with wood mulch for a pathway it's not really a problem now they do say some of these dyes that are sprayed on the mulches if you go not natural that can cause problems and there's cocoa mulch which tastes like or smells like chocolate that's not good for dogs and it can cause mold and mildew on your pathway so just a regular wood mulch that you get from a tree service would be just fine and two to four inches and now keep in mind that two to four inches over the course of one three five years is going to break down you're going to need to reapply all right, Holly, next question here. What are you, as I harvest my garlic scapes and soon to harvest my garlic, what can I do with all these garlic scapes? Sure. So I like to often cut them up and put them into different stir fries or dishes. I actually made some homemade burrito bowls, so I included them with the onions and peppers that I had cut up and then Joey did some stir fry vegetables recently and we added that to those. And then you can make garlic scape pesto. You definitely want to. It's rich. It. It's it rich. rich. Yeah. So you want to cut it with some basil um, and just utilize it like you would maybe. What would you say ratio wise on that? I would say like normal. If, if you are making pesto, normally whatever it calls for garlic cloves, I would just double that amount in garlic scapes or maybe even triple it because it does have a strong garlic flavor. I wouldn't do like solely just garlic scapes. I would definitely make sure you do at least half and half or one quarter to three quarters basil. And, or you could, if you have kale, you could do like a kale pesto as well. Um, so definitely like kind of what what you would maybe use um, garlic for, but just a little bit more. I, you, I know like in our stir fry. And you can throw like them on like the grill can. too. Yeah, you can grill them. But, but you, if these, this is not something you're going to eat raw. You're going to have to process it in some form or fashion because it, it is very, it's like eating a thick piece of grass, the, the density of it. So by, you want to, you do want to cook it somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cook it somehow. But yeah. You, and then I guess you could freeze, you can freeze that basil or that, not that basil. You could freeze that pesto, right? Yeah. You can freeze the pesto. You could even do like an herb butter. I think with the garlic scapes, make like a garlic scape butter. If you ever make herb butter, that's an option as well. Well, we talked to, to Greg Peterson, the, the segment before here, and this is something that many 
uh, high-end restaurants seek out for garlic scapes because garlic scapes typically happen two weeks a year on hard neck garlic, and that's it. It's not like you can get a pineapple anytime you want. It is a certain amount of time, and that's it. So many different options, great sources online and what you can do with your garlic scapes. But uh, it's a hard neck garlic, so if you've not grown hard neck garlic or not grown garlic at all, uh, that is what you want to do. And you harvest the garlic scapes about two to four weeks before you actually dig up the garlic bulbs because you're removing the scapes in order to put more energy into the bulb to get uh, the larger bulb. Well, Holly, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Miss any portion of the program today or would like to revisit it? You can do that by going to your favorite podcast platform and searching on the gardening with joy and holly radio show we have hundreds of segments and or shows over the past seven years so you can check that out you can also find it at our parent website which is the wisconsin vegetable gardener.com season one through seven is listed at the top of the page and or you can send us an email to garden talk radio and we will get you the link to the program tune in next week to the program where we will be discussing the problems that your tomato plants are facing and we will answer what the problems are and how to resolve them as well as adding native plants to your landscape and why you should be doing that our guest is rebecca aka the eastern gardener and we'll answer your garden questions so until next week for hi Baird. i'm joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. <laughs>